Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Peak Human. We're back again for another episode. This one is with me being interviewed by Courtney Swan. She's great. She's at Real Foodology on Instagram. She's on the same page. She interviewed me the other day, and I decided to put it out because I've been so busy trying to open the Sapien Center that I haven't recorded that many episodes. I have some more episodes coming out soon. I got some great guest suggestions. I've been connecting with some people, so we'll have some great episodes coming up in the near future. But until then, I wanted everyone to hear this episode where I finally get a chance to talk the whole time. A little bit indulgent. Here's my self-indulgent interview. I get to be the one to answer the questions for once. I kind of like these every once in a while, so I don't have to do so much talking when I can give my guests the floor on their episodes, and then maybe I get my own episode every once in a while. I keep forgetting not everyone knows all about me, so it's good for them to hear it. Even with Instagram, I don't post about myself much. I don't do reels of myself talking. I really don't like making it about me, so I'm going to give in and make it about me for this episode. I'm also gonna make it about my company knows the tale. We have the great regenerative beef, bison, lamb. We've got the pasture raised chicken and pork on the low PUFA diet. We actually had to take the chicken out of stock because we had a USDA snafu. So that can be only picked up in person in Austin at the Sapien Center soon. We're getting the pork back in stock soon after our butcher date. But for now we have a ton of beef, bison, and lamb on the website. But also, more importantly perhaps to some, we have the skin food in stock. We finally got that giant order in and we're still waiting on that deodorant. Super excited about the deodorant and the hair food, hair care and hair food, guys and girls. We have different formulas for different needs. That is coming very soon, but for now, skin food is back. This is the moisturizer. It's beyond a moisturizer. It soaks up into your skin. Your skin eats it. That's the whole point of why it's called skin food. This is the stuff where I got sunburned once. I know it doesn't happen often, but I got roasted five hours straight up sunlight, no sunscreen, got a little red. Usually I would have peeled. I put on the skin food, did not peel at all, just turned into a tan. This stuff is amazing. People swear by it. We have a baby balm even for parents to use on their babies. No scent on that one. We also have an unscented skin food. Even the scented ones are just a bit of essential oils. None of the natural, quote, natural scents or flavors. We don't use that stuff. We just use real essential oils. So check those out at nosetail.org. Get your biltong there. We got the biltong and the drovors and the livervores. Livervores is drovors, which is a stick version of biltong, which is a South African dried meat, air dried, not dehydrated at a high temperature. It is air dried at a low temperature, soft, tender, no funny stuff. We don't need curing agents. We don't need sugar. It just uses a bit of vinegar and spices. It's great. And the livervores has liver in it, 30% liver. You can get all those nutrients on the go. Then there's the seasonings. Man, these are good. I just made some of our bison into burger patties with the Thai seasoning and served it at a vent at the Sapien Center last night. So good. So good. I put a little too much though. Haha, <laughs> got carried away. It was still good. So check all that out at nosetail.org. If you're in Austin, come see us in person at the Sapien Center. We're even on Google now. Give us a review on Google if you'd like. Give this podcast a review. That's helpful as well. Gets the word out. So back to this episode today, it's with Courtney Swan. She has a master's in nutrition and integrative health. She's great. Like I said, on the same page. Follow her on Instagram. Check her out. Maybe I can have a full interview with her one day. But for now, she's interviewing me. Hope you enjoy this one. Hope you get some great stuff at nosetail.org. Hope you check us out in person at the Sapien Center in Austin. And I hope everyone's doing well and enjoy this one with myself and Courtney. I'm very excited about this interview. I have been following you on Instagram for a while now. And something that I really appreciate about you Mm -hmm. is that you don't sugarcoat things. You just Mm -hmm. tell people the truth as they are. And that's really what all of us should be doing in this health and wellness world. But it... (laughs) We've gotten to a place where we're scared to speak the truth and we don't want to hurt people's feelings, but I really am of the mind that we are really harming people and we are hurting them by not telling them the honest truth. Well, my account's called Food Lies, so I'm all about exposing the lies and telling the truth and it's been working. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely working. You've you've gotten me <laughs> very excited. <laughs> um, so I just watched your um, the preview for your docu-series Food Lies. And I am so excited for this to come out. Um, I love in the beginning, you said, how can the smartest species to ever live be so clueless about what to eat? 
-hmm. So before we dive into that, what was the catalyst behind this docu-series? Well, it's been almost six years trying to put it together. It's been a long road, but it all started about nine years ago when I lost both of my parents. Mm. So we kind of mentioned in the intro, you know, it kind of, the intro is on the Food Lies YouTube channel. It's three and a half minutes. It took us about a year and a half to make. We kind of did it, you know, scene by scene. We handmade every single one of those almost. And um, it's just a huge project that means a lot to me because, yeah, I, I lost both my parents when I was only 30. And it's just a huge mm. wake up call. I also was kind of turning into the dad bod type of thing around 30, you know, and I thought that's just how it was, you know, back then you don't know anything about health. I was following the food pyramid. My family followed the food pyramid. So I get it. Like I, I call out a lot of people online who are nutritionists and whatever, and they're, and they're just spreading the same thing, the food pyramid, the same diets. And of course people aren't going to, they're not going to follow it and they're not going to get healthy because of the wrong information, right? So everyone says they're they're doing what they can, even the fat acceptance movement, which I kind of just posted on a little bit today with yeah. Lizzo. Uh, like, of course, if you think you're doing all the right things and it's not working, then it must be just you're doomed, right? You're genetically doomed. This is how I'm supposed to be. I thought that, my family thought that. We were eating the food pyramid. I grew up in Hawaii. We were eating rice. We were eating lean chicken. We were eating low-fat yogurt, low-fat milk, all the fruits and vegetables, limiting red meat. You know, steak was a big deal. I don't remember having steak much at all, even. And yeah, and then they just basically had all these problems. They had pre-diabetes. Now that I look back, also mm -hmm. doing some research for the film, the CDC website says nine out of ten people who have pre-diabetes don't know it. How crazy yeah. is that? Nine out of 10 people who have it don't even know it because we're not diagnosing it. Same thing with my parents. I look back. Yes, they had all the signs. They weren't obese. They just had the big belly. It's basically insulin resistance belly, had all the little signs of, of prediabetes. No one told them. It just got worse and worse. We kept eating the, the 7 to 11 servings of grain. We got the pasta, the low, you know, low fat chicken, all the stuff I mentioned, hmm. getting worse and worse. So that's yeah, that's how I started this whole project. It It's become my whole life now. And yeah, just, I just really want to get the correct information out there. Yeah. Yeah. Same. You and I are very aligned with that. How do you think we got everything so backwards? Like how has our public health gotten this so wrong where we have this food pyramid that um, it has gotten it really wrong. And do you think that this is on purpose Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I actually did a, a presentation at a conference called Exposing the Trillion Dollar Agenda Against Red Meat. Mm. So I dug really deep into that. And I think there, there was a lot of stuff that was guided in a certain direction. You know, you can kind of look back and you're like, oh, yeah, we got some things wrong. There was some science that was done in the 1950s and 60s. And we didn't have all the technology we have now and we don't have all the, yeah, there's even like ways to test food and like know about the nutrients and how it affects people and that type of stuff. And then you could say, okay, then the big food companies came along and they were just like, oh, well, fat is bad. So let's just replace it with a whole bunch of processed grains and sugar. And you know what I mean? I've done like the first five years, I kind of just thought it was just about money and that it just kind of was an accident. And then lately, I've been wearing a tinfoil hat. No, I uh, <laughs> I kind of, I just woke up to like a few more things about how the world work. I think people who wake up about the sick care industry, right? We don't yeah. call it the healthcare industry. Uh, they, they were like, wait a second. So this is all backwards. The healthcare system's backwards. The food system's backwards. Like what else is backwards? And then you can kind of keep going and uh, it's a, sort of a bottomless hole of like, well, what, how is society set up this way? So I don't, I don't want to get too far off of nutrition, but I just think a lot of things are kind of set up in ways that aren't beneficial to individuals, right? It's not about individual yeah. health. None of these systems are good for individual health or individual wealth or individual anything. It's more about gigantic systems like government sized systems, you know, nation sized systems or even world systems that are there 
to just kind of keep people in line, honestly, right? Just like, just let them be like ants in a colony and just, all right, we need to put some things in place and tell them what to eat. And, oh, we can, this is cheap. We have a whole bunch of corn, wheat, and soy, and we can subsidize it and we can afford, you know, to feed the masses this. And that's what happened since the Egyptian times, since we invented grains, it's kind of there to feed the masses. Yeah. Yeah. You made some great points there. And, and I think something that people really need to understand is that there unfortunately is money in sick people. They make money off of people that are sick. I mean, cancer and diabetes are billion dollar industries. And if we can get people to a place where they're just sick enough that they're not dying, they're on medications, their whole life, they're in the hospital. Um, you know, they have all these medical bills, like we're, they're making money off of people in that way. And that for me was really when I got, I guess you would call it red pilled mm -hmm. was when I finally really started to understand that. And that a lot of these public policies do not have our best interests in our health in mind. And especially the food companies that are making all of our foods, they do not have our health in mind when they are creating these products. And this is what people I think really need to understand. And that for me was the beginning of kind of peeling back all these layers and, you know, peeling back the onion. So I want to talk to you about mm -hmm. vegan propaganda, because this is something I think you and I are both very aligned in. Mm -hmm. What are some of the main ways that vegan propaganda has really influenced health recommendations? Mm. Well, it's coming to a fever pitch recently. I, I thought, I you know, we saw the peak. I mean, even five years, five and a half years ago, when I started making the film, I saw What the Health. And it oh was God, the vegan yes. film, right? Maybe it was, was six years ago. I think, yeah. well, it was really the day <laughs> I decided to make the film was because I watched that. And then I just was like, well, this is opposite uh, of everything that I just learned, everything that I did to change my own health. I, I didn't really tell my story. Quick detour. Not only was I getting a dad bod, I had acid reflux, like heartburn. I had all this joint pain. I had chronic overuse injuries, inflammation from using the computer. And I just had all these little problems, allergies, all that went away. All I did was kind of just cut out just, well, it was the three ingredients, the seed oils, the grains, and the sugar, cut that out. All that stuff went away. It doesn't make sense to people. You're like, your allergies went away. I'm like, I had allergies my entire life and they went away. And if I go to a restaurant, Maybe sometimes I have a charcuterie board, you know, and it's like, okay, let's try some of this bread. Maybe it's sourdough bread. Maybe it's not so bad. Allergies the next day. Mm. It's it's crazy. So okay, vegan though. So I had, I, a, I had a very similar story. So I just had to share that. I used go. to suffer so immensely from acid reflux that I had to get a, a camera down my throat because it was, it was so bad that they thought that I was like deteriorating my, um, my esophagus. And it, the second that I changed my diet around, it just went away. Like it was just gone. I couldn't even, yeah, explain it. It's, it's crazy. And yeah, like people think it's <laughs> from eating like a lot of meat and cheese and like rich foods. Like, no, I only eat rich foods now and I've Same. never had it. <laughs> like I've never had it. Like it yeah. completely went away. So people just have to understand. I mean, it really boils <clears> down <throat> for me. I've been on all these different paths. I will get to the vegan question soon, but I've been yeah. down all these different paths of kind of dietary thoughts and camps over the past nine years when I first started. And then, you know, six years when I kind of did it full time. And I always, I, I always try to come up with like the unifying theory of nutrition, I call it, or like, you know, it's kind of like Einstein. He's trying to find out e equals MC squared. Like this universe just makes sense. And so many different diet camps and things, they can actually be debunked. You know, it's mm -hmm. like carnivore, like, you know, I'm friends with a lot of these carnivore guys, but you can debunk their, it's like, this doesn't make sense. Like if you're saying that all plants are toxic, then why are, you know, people who are, you know, eating whole food, plant heavy diets, I'm not saying they're vegan, but whole food, plant heavy diets, they're doing fine. They're living long. They're doing great. Mm -hmm. Like your, your theories just break down. Same thing. Obviously the vegan theories break down because everyone's thriving on meat. We've thrived on meat for all history. And now we're finally rediscovering that. So, so many diets can be debunked. It's like, what is the truth behind it all? Mm -hmm. And to me, it's kind of like your Instagram name. It's like real food. It's like, it comes down to all the good diets have in common is that they're using real foods and they're avoiding the three ingredients that I'll probably mention five more times on this episode. It's the refined grains. It's not all grains. I mean, you could even 
figure out, you know, people traditionally could eat some grains, you know what I mean? I, well, it wasn't great. We actually, our, our height and health suffered once we started incorporating too many grains in our diet, displacing mm -hmm. good nutrition. And you can see that in the archaeological record around 12,000 years ago. And friends with an uh, archaeologist, Dr. Bill Schindler, who talks about the skeletal difference. They look at the remains before and after agriculture, striking. We, our brains got wow. smaller. We got shorter. There's more, uh, yeah, so uh, there's more lesions. You could see disease in the bones. There's more arthritis. There's more all these things once we started eating grains. And so mm -hmm. people don't really know that, that not, they're not maybe bad for everyone. I don't want to like, and there's different ways to prepare them, <laughs> right? You can prepare grains, you can soak and ferment and there, you know, there's that kind of thing, but I think they're just displacing good nutrition. They're, they're not nutrient dense. They're just, they're not very good. They're kind of for keeping people alive. So especially with nowadays is they're ultra refined grains and it's just like white flour. And then there's the added sugar and then there's the seed oils. So these are these three ingredients that make up, I mean, probably up to 80% of people's diets. A lot of people's diets could be 80% those. If you look at a grocery store, it could be about 80% products just made from those three ingredients, different combinations of them, right? All the inside of the aisles of the store, everyone says you're not supposed to shop in that type of thing. It, it's wild. So that's like kind of the root of all I've seen is like, if you eat uh, too high amounts of these refined ingredients, you're going to be sick. And if you avoid them, you're fine. Yeah. Well, and I, yes. And you actually, I mean? I, like, I mean, that can't be, I've never seen that debunked. Like you can debunk all kinds of diets, even paleo. They're like, oh, well, we can't eat dairy because we didn't have it back then. Like, you can eat raw dairy like this, yes. you know what I mean? Like we don't need to avoid like actually good cheese that's raw dairy and fermented correctly and not, you know, having additives and stuff like that. Well, this is because nature doesn't create bad foods, laboratories, factories, men, like man-made products are what are creating these bad foods. And this is why I get so upset when I see these dietitians trying to they try to justify this by saying there's no such thing as good to bad foods. I'm like, mm -hmm. there is though, there is <laughs> when we're talking about the difference between whole real foods versus highly palatable, hyper-processed, um, refined seed oils, high fructose corn syrups, all the things that we meddled with, these are not nature made. These were man-made. And I just, it drives me crazy because we are vilifying these foods that we've been eating since the dawn of time. And we're trying to blame these foods on modern diseases that we are only now more recently seeing. And this is where I get really upset about this vegan propaganda. And like you said, we can, we can talk about both camps. Cause I think this is really, this is a really important part of this conversation is that we are now separating into these two camps of either you are vegan, plant-based, this is the right way, or like carnivore, this is the right way. And mm -hmm. my thinking is that it's somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. And, but I, I really am having our time right now with this vegan propaganda, which is why I wanted to have a conversation about it. Because again, a lot of what your film is about is what I talk about all the time is that we are so confused now about what to eat. And there's so much propaganda coming from these billion dollar marketing mm -hmm. campaigns that are trying to get people away from eating certain foods. And one of them right now that's the people are just being infiltrated with is this vegan propaganda. And we're trying mm -hmm. to vilify meat and make it be this horrible demonized food. Well, okay. I'll answer your question now. So for their food products to be good, your meat and eggs and fat need to be bad. Yeah. Right. Th th this is how they do it. This is like, <clears throat> they have to create this this war and this kind of like two sides. I mean, a lot of societies like that, it's always like split up into two sides against each other. So I hate all of the politics stuff. It's just all yeah. bogus, just two sides fighting. It's crazy. So if you go back, it's a lot about money. And so, okay, I was going, I went from where, what the health to the next vegan film I was going to say is Game Changers. James Cameron had $140 million invested in his pea protein company. He, you know, like there's always the big interest involved in selling a product. So I have a grass fed meat company called Nose to Tail, sell like regenerative meat, like the best meat you can buy, super expensive and no profit margin. So, so that, so once I started, I realized, oh, I get it. 
I have no money. I can barely have, I have half an employee. Like I have one half of an employee. That's it. And then you look at Kraft Foods. You look at all these gigantic companies that sell the highly processed food. There's such a big profit margin in it. That's actually what it came down to in my presentation about, it wasn't just about the trillion dollar agenda against red meat. It was kind of just, well, it was because it came down to the money. It was about how much money is in processing plant foods, Mm. right? It's like there's this fundamental nature of processing down plants, mainly grains, seeds, and you know stuff like that, sugar, corn syrup, that type of thing, vegetable oils, that is highly profitable. And that's what that's how actually the first accumula- accumulation of wealth happened back in the day is why we have societies and the, the pharaohs and the slaves was because they could tax grains and they could accumulate and store them. And you know, the, the disparity of wealth all happened. We went from egalitarian societies of hunter gatherers where everyone's pretty equal and, you know, men and women were equal. And there was, there, there was, you know, there was some sort of leader, but it wasn't like he was way above everyone else. And it could have been a woman leader. You know what I mean? Like the, all that stuff, we were all kind of the same until you process down plant foods. You realize how much money you can make. You can store them for long times. You, you can just basically accumulate wealth. That's what the story is now. Why is there the vegan propaganda? It's the same story. You make so much more money off it when you're using the cheap refined ingredients. And then you have this gigantic profit margin that you could use to do the marketing. What is all the marketing? It's all for the breakfast cereals and all the highly profitable foods, like all these advertisements, well, also pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, so if yeah. you, but it starts with the food. If you have all this money <clears throat> making, uh, selling these refined foods with the, this long shelf life, you know, really easy to, to pump out huge profit margins. You pay for the marketing, you pay for studies that say, you know, what are these studies that say that, that past is healthy? They're funded by Barilla, this gigantic <laughs> pasta company. It's every time you look it up. And then there's a lobbying too. If you have so much profit margin, yeah. then you can afford to pay millions of dollars to lobbyists. They're in Washington, D.C. They're wherever around the world doing all the lobbying, keeping things as is. So that's another part. It just stays the same. It's it's like it's hard to undo what happened, what started in the 50s with this idea that you know saturated fat was bad, meat was bad. Oh, so you know all this whole grains must be good. That type of thing. You can't turn that ship around. There's too many big interests involved, and that's where the vegan propaganda is coming from. And now it's changing to the climate propaganda too. Not saying mm-hmm. I'm not like you know saying there's nothing wrong with what's going on with the climate. Yet people are pumping out. You know factories are pumping out coal into the atmosphere. There's plenty going on that's wrong with how we're doing, you know, big industry, but I don't think the, the cows are the, le- the, le- the smallest problem. You know what I mean? The, these, these cows and their methane, it, it's a, it's a whole different story. Like 90% of the problem is coming from big industry, other industries, like, you know, flying private jets, for example, or just, you know, so, yeah. So, so they're mixing in this, this climate story too, to try to convince people to not eat meat and to avoid animal foods and to conveniently eat their fake processed foods that I think have worse of an impact. If you do some actual studies and some people have done them, you, you can look at the full impact of these things. I think they, they aren't getting the full impact of say the, the beyond meat. You know, I don't think they're accounting for everything because I know there's so many inputs it takes to make fake foods and even just refrigeration. You have to keep all this stuff at a very cool temperature and you have all these outside inputs of antibiotics and stuff or uh, just just agents to make it so it doesn't spoil or you don't grow bacteria like there's just so much going on and with these inputs it's just it can't be as good for the environment as sticking a cow on some grass (laughs) and you know what i mean and and there's different ways you can grow animals obviously so you got the climate angle or just environmental angle you got the they're they're still using the same health the bad health, you know, advice, bad health stuff that's been debunked and there's studies that come out and no one cares about them. No one knows. There's five studies in the annals of internal medicine, like a very respectful journey journal saying there's no problem with red meat. We looked at all the meta-analysis. We looked at all the studies over all the years, nothing, nothing there. 
you know, like it's just a lot of correlational stuff that we thought red meat was bad because people who, uh, who ate more red meat are going against the guidelines and they smoked more and they drank more and they exercise less and eat way more processed foods. So man, I'm going on a rant here, but that it's, so they, it. they, they're tying up all the, the health stuff, the old outdated health stuff with the new environmental stuff. And then they'll even try to tie in the ethical stuff to make you feel bad about eating animals when that's how nature works. We've always eaten animals. This is the nature of life for something to live, something must die. So now mm -hmm. they have these three arguments. And if you're in the mainstream, if you're just an average Joe or Jane walking around, you're like, oh, it makes sense. Bad for the environment. Eating meat's bad for the environment. It's going to give me a heart attack and it's bad to kill animals. And then they just go along with it. And mm -hmm. then the more and more, these giant corporations are making more and more money and it just keeps going. It keeps going. Well, in... The funny thing that I find is that there's so much iron irony in the messaging. So people that are, um, really concerned about the animals, I, I'm empathetic to that. So I don't want anyone to think that I'm like shitting on their, their morals around this because mm -hmm. I was actually plant-based for five years because mm -hmm. of animal welfare concerns. Um, <clears throat> but I think what a lot of people need to understand is what you just said was that in order for, um, one to live some like something must die. Mm -hmm. And this is part of, of our work as humans on this planet is understanding that this is just how life works. It's part of the life cycle of being on planet earth, unfortunately. And we all have to come to terms with our own death and the death of, of loved ones and animals and, and people and, and things that we really care about. Um, and then on top of that, when you look at just the way that we are farming, we kill more ground animals just by doing this industrial, um, conventional way of farming with the spraying of the pesticides and the monocropping. And all of this is what is actually contributing, really contributing to climate change because we're destroying our soil. The carbon's no longer being brought down back into the soil. And as a result, our food is not as healthy for us. It's not as high in vitamins and minerals. And then, like I said, we're killing all these ground animals. So there's really no way around it. Either we're killing all these ground animals or um, we're eating a cow that hopefully is grazing in pastures, you know, in the grass. But the biggest thing for me, and this is where I think all of us meet in the middle, whether you're vegan, carnivore, whatever it is, is that we, I think we're all in agreement. We need to get rid of factory farming because that is just horrible. It's not good for the animals. It's not good for our health. And I think that's where we can all kind of agree. And I've been saying this for years. I'm like, vegans, I'm on your side. Like we're all against this. Why don't we all come together and, and get rid of this? Cause we, we need to have the cows back on, on pastures and grazing as nature intended. That's the message. And that's how I know people don't really care about that because they're completely missing the point. <laughs> and I mean, I think yeah. Vegans have their their strong ideology, and it's like a religion to them. So they're they're never going to say that message. But what I well, how I know that the big industry and the big powers that be, governments, all the people you hear, they're insincere because they should be having that message, and they're not saying it. Their mm -hmm. their their message is just buy the processed foods, and meat is bad, and like they they can't think that that's the end of the story. And I. I it just has to be, you know, the other reason, which is the whole profit train. And, oh, you brought up a good point about all the animals that die. I actually didn't know there was actually four times uh, as the animals die in four different times. And the studies show there it was, I, oh man, I don't want to quote it because it's wrong, but more animals die, more mice die to raise, say, a certain mm. amount of grain than beef. They did a study in Australia. But what I learned about all the animals that die, there's four different times. One, to clear out the, the land, and they have to decimate entire ecosystems of animals mm. to make room for cropland. And this maybe has happened a long time ago or more recently, but it had to happen. It is not natural to have thousands of acres of corn or wheat or soy or anything like that. Completely not. They have to wipe out everything. Then, like you said, all, all these pesticides, herbs, they're spraying everything, killing all kinds of stuff. There's mm -hmm. also along that their farmers have to pay to shoot animals. They have to, they actually like, you know, have hired guns, like actual guns to, to shoot animals to protect their fields. Then they're, they're killed in the harvesting, these big combines, like actually mm -hmm. chop up 
like all these ground nesting animals, ground nesting birds, baby deer, like mice, all kinds of, but like bigger animals too, like, you know, small deers. And then this is the last one I didn't know about. They're also, once you harvest it, all their food source is gone. So now there's oh, yeah. thousands of thousands of animals that starve to death. And I did not know about this one until a, a farmer told me about it. He's like, oh yeah, now they slowly starve to death. So there's no way around it and people need to understand that. And it's just, we're going away from nature. So it's part of it is people just live in cities. They're not connected with nature at all. So that's, I think that's what the only reason vegans exist. Like a vegan wouldn't exist in the past because we mm -hmm. were just connected with nature and we, we knew what was going on and people, they would witness dozens of animals dying before they even could talk for their food. You know, you, you just see it growing up and it's like, oh, we're killing this chicken so we can eat. And it would have been part of your life. And now I think a bit purposefully are being disconnected from nature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just more like, oh, just get the newest VR headset and, you know, live in a box in the city and, you know, don't worry about where your food came from Buy you know, buy it from a factory instead of a farm. And, oh, it's, it's becoming like Wally. -E. <laughs> yeah. We put a little clip of Wally -E in the first episode. Food Lies is now a six part series. And we put a little clip of Wally -E to, to, you know, call it out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's scary what's happening and, and not to sound like a broken record, but it, it there is a, an element there where it feels very, um, like it's on purpose. I mean, you shared something the other day on your Instagram about how media outlets are sharing about a study that came out about ultra processed foods that are linked to cancer and premature death. And then they were using photos of meat as the main cover. And that was not even what the study found. It was highly processed, ultra processed foods, but these large corporations, I mean, you have to think about like the media um, a lot of these media outlets are being funded by these large corporations that are creating these foods and they can't, you know, bite the hand that feeds them. Oh, I know people that, that have got uninvited from shows. They were booked on a news program and then they found out that they were going to talk about mm. anti like cereal or, and processed foods and the advertiser. Yeah. Who funds them? It's Kellogg's all the, they said, no, this person cannot come on. Wow. I mean, it's that, it, I can't remember what film it was in. It might've been uh, fed up. I can't remember which one it was, but when Michelle Obama first started her whole initiative to get America healthier, her main message in the very beginning was to get people away from highly processed foods and sodas and, you know, packaged foods, the food industry got wind of it and they met with her and they shifted her message to be more about moving your body instead of like cutting out these processed foods. And then of course her whole movement was sponsored by, I don't remember which brands it was, but you know, it was probably like the Quaker Oats and the Kellogg's and, you know, Coca-Cola, all mm -hmm. these big name brand companies. I do remember seeing that maybe it was <clears throat> fed up, fed up, you know, good quality film. And yeah, this is what they've always done. They started the energy balance consortium. Coca-Cola started this which is basically they're just promoting eat less, move more. If you are overweight or unhealthy, it's be it's not because you drank our sugar water or corn syrup water. It's yeah. because you didn't move enough. It's your fault. You didn't move enough. You didn't exercise enough. You're just a slob. And our, our corn syrup water is fine. Mm. And they've been trying to do this for decades. And there's different names for it. There's different yeah they they pay for so many movement studies any anything they can to keep that message alive that it's your fault and that's actually one of my biggest things that i do like i'm in the real food world like you it's just i and i'm against the guys there's different like instagram influencer type people even with phds that are saying no 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 you just gotta if it fits your macros you just gotta count oh, your calories yeah, yeah. and it's crazy. And I get into debates with these people and I just, I, I can't, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. And because it's, it's exact opposite of what I believe in. Like, it's kind of like there's these two different paradigms and one paradigm is this mainstream industry funded paradigm. That's just eat less, move more. There's no bad foods. Yeah. If, if you, if you, there's, yeah, like the people you're talking about, if there's bad foods and we're going to create eating disorders around these things and, like, no, there are bad foods. Like you said, there absolutely are. And there are good foods. Good foods come from nature. Bad foods come from 
the lab or the factory. So they just say it's on you. You needed to eat less and move more. And we're saying that is not it, that your body is just not meant to have these foods. And it takes maybe longer for it to catch up to some people than others. And for me, it was about when I was 30. And I interviewed a great PhD, Michael Rose, who studies this stuff. He came up with, with some of the, the best research. He used fruit flies. And then he kind of went on from there. But great research on, on aging and metabolism and health. And he's a big proponent of just eating real foods, kind of just going back to the way we used to eat. He's, for one, if you paid me a million dollars to guess his age, I would say 45, not a day over 45. He's 65. Watch his presentation. Look wow. up his age, Dr. Michael Rose. He's 65 on stage. I'm like, that guy's a 45-year-old. Uh, did a podcast with him. He's amazing, getting him in the film. But what he, what his paradigm is that it's not that we you, your metas, metabolism slows down when you age. People say that, oh, you know, I'm not a kid anymore. I don't have the fast metabolism. It's the opposite. It's that as you age, you're less adapted. You're less able to eat the modern processed foods. Mm. it's very interesting and it, it makes a lot more sense. It's just like, it's almost like you can get away with it while you're younger and then it catches up to you, right? And so that's what I'm saying. There's like two paradigms. It's just his, his paradigm is what he's found scientifically. And, you know, so many of the other people that I interview have found this scientifically that your body is not made for certain foods. You can get away with them if you white knuckle it enough, you know, to count calories and be starving and you, maybe you can force it to work for a certain amount of time it's not going to work in the end in the long term maybe you can do it for a couple months and you can lose a few pounds that doesn't mean anything right if you're just eating less of the same bad foods and that you're like oh it worked oh wow like i i went on vacation and i, I dropped a little bit of weight that means nothing. That doesn't mean it's healthy. That doesn't mean you got enough nutrients. It actually probably means you lost muscle mass. Mm -hmm. Really, there's studies that show that if people who drop weight on reduced calorie diets without enough protein and nutrients, and they'll just lose muscle mass. So the scale doesn't know your muscle mass, right? It's just, you, you think you're losing fat, you're losing muscle. That's the worst thing you can do. You, yeah. you need muscle. You want muscle. Muscle is like a hack it's like a secret to being healthy because it can burn more glucose basically you can just burn more calories when you're not even working out just by having more muscle you can handle more foods and, and you don't have to you know you know restrict so many calories so oh man i keep going on these rants that go <laughs> maybe it. on some <laughs> tangents but it, it you 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 can't have this idea that there are no bad foods and that you just need to eat less move more it's it's just such it's such a, the the wrong message and I actually have a solution my version is called eat densely move intensely mm. so it, eat less move more right it kind of just means nothing it's like telling someone to to be rich you just need to make more money than you <laughs> then exactly uh, but so i'm saying eat densely move intensely eat densely means eat nutrient dense foods like you need like nutrient dense foods are pretty much any food from nature they 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 have they naturally have the correct nutrient density. They give you enough, especially if you're eating animal foods. You get enough protein. You get enough nutrients. And basically, any foods that are processed are not nutrient dense. You know, what I mean, it's almost the definition of nutrient density is unprocessed foods, mm -hmm. right? Processed foods are basically shoving in a whole bunch of seed oils and sugar and grains into foods which make them less nutrient dense by almost definition well and they've literally stripped away all of the vitamins minerals and nutrients that were in those foods by heating them up processing them doing all the you know the processing of making that food exactly exactly so not all yeah it's denuded of nutrients it's mm -hmm. it's deficient it's they're just they're gone so that's the eat densely part and then move intensely. I guess it's not required, but I think move intensely means don't just do steady state cardio. It's not just about doing more like humans. I, I really just don't think, well, I mean, I visited tribes in Africa last year. Like they didn't just like jog. Like there was no just, oh, I'm going to go on a treadmill. You know, well, obviously, but they, they either sprinted or they walked. 
and they lifted things, right? They're, they're, they're working or they're sprinting or walking. And I think that's to me what move intensely means. It's what I think walking is great. I think sprinting is absolutely amazing. And I think working as in lifting weights or doing any type of sports exercise is absolutely great. I actually wanted to ask you a little bit about your travels and what you saw the differences in these cultures versus like how Americans live. Like, did you see a difference in the chronic diseases that they had, the pain that they were suffering from? Um, and obviously there was, a, they had a totally different diet than we did. What was mm. kind of the big main messages that you found in that? It's just the further away you get from the city, <clears throat> the healthier they were. Mm. So that's what I found. I spent time in Tanzania with the Hadza and the Maasai and some other groups. And then Uganda with the pygmies, the Batwa. Uh, as soon as you, so you, you get into the cities, it's a little bit like America, but like they're 30 years behind. <laughs> that makes sense, wow. right? So yeah. they're, they're just starting to get the, the obesity and type 2 diabetes, but it's not rampant yet. Then you get into the villages. You know, we spent a lot of time driving. And then you can see people, you, you see the diets change and you see the health change. Then when you get all the way out to, you know, people actually living like we used to, just completely healthy. They had no health issues. They hmm. we were asking them all, all these things, like, do you have back pain? And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then we're like, oh, like, does your back ever hurt? And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, oh, like, do you ever hurt your back? You're like, oh yeah, I fell out of a tree. <laughs> like last year in my back, it's like, no. And then we finally explained to them, they're like, they're like, no. And we're talking to like old person. They're like, absolutely not. Do your knees hurt? They're like, no, my, none of this. I do not have joint pain. I do not pain. They're like, do you have problems with pregnancy? They're like, no. Do you have problems around mm. your period? No. A a anything we ask them, they're just say no to. And wow. it, it was pretty amazing. Uh, they, most of them had amazing teeth too. If people are familiar with the Weston Price Weston stuff, Price. Yeah. yeah, it was really cool to see. Like, I have a video of this girl who's lives in a grass hut. She's a Hudza, like actual grass hut. You know, what I mean, that's all. Like, she doesn't go sleep somewhere else once we left. Like, that's where she slept on the ground. No, obviously, never heard of a dentist. Huge jaw, fully formed, all her teeth, perfect smile. Like. She would be on a Crest commercial. Like it was amazing. That's and, really incredible. Yeah. <laughs> it, and so the, these people were just out hunting, hunting, gathering all day. And the men were, they went out and hunted every day and they always got meat. They didn't, they didn't have access to a lot of the big animals they used to back in the day. Way back in the day, we used to have access to gigantic mammals. Before about 12,000 years ago, there used to be or 13,000 years ago, there was giant megafauna roaming the earth and mastodons and woolly mammoth and giant sloths, and we could get tons of animals. Then it went to small animals, and now they have barely any animals, but they still get mm -hmm. them, and they, and they go home and they cook them. And the women were gathering tubers, and they would cook them by a fire, and then they would gnaw on them. And it was actually interesting because they were so fibrous, you couldn't even eat it. You actually just gnawed on it and got some like basically sugar out of it, and then you spit out the fiber. It was really interesting. So I kind of learned a lot about the, the microbiome too. Like I'm just so against all the Purells and the sanitizers and all that Same. stuff. And yeah, and, and and there's these studies of the Hadza that they say, oh, well, they eat like a thousand grams of fiber per second. And they're, you know, all this stuff. I'm like, I don't know. All I saw them eating was uh, some meat and like tubers, you know, like they weren't eating like thousands and thousands of plant foods. Like I think there's this, modern lens that we see because i've talked to some of these guys that do the research because i over my interviews throughout the years and they're caught up in this you know this paradigm anyway that i think they're they have a great microbiome and the microbiome is huge so important to health and they have a great microbiome because they are eating from the ground they're eating from nature they're getting dirt everywhere like they they cut open this little animal they got a little deer and we they cooked it for us. And before they cooked it, they took, they opened it up and this knife was never been washed, dirt all over it, guts all over it. They cut the guts out, gave it to the dogs. There was like slimy mm. yellow and green stuff from the intestines all over the knife, cut open the liver, gave me a piece of liver. And I just ate the liver raw. And that oh. whole trip, I never felt better. I was gone for over two weeks, felt amazing. I think I improved my microbiome. I think it was 
a gift that I went that for my health that I, I got to go there and just eat stuff from the ground and just not worry about it. And yeah, I think that uh, contributes to their health. And it, also the lack of like pollutants too, right? They're out there. They're not getting all the plastics. They're not getting all these like chemicals. They're not getting the fake foods, all that stuff. Pesticide runoff. Yeah. Endocrine disruptors, all the fragrances, the cleaning products, the Purells. Yeah. It's <laughs> a big issue. Excuse me. I'm coming, I'm <laughs> recovering from a really crazy cough that I had. Um, mm. Yeah. But that's really fascinating. So the majority, what was the, um, the majority of the foods they ate just meat and tubers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they got <laughs> some berries, uh, they got some honey. There were, uh, the Maasai are famous for doing the blood and the, the milk. So we did that with the Maasai. So the men, they just, that was their breakfast. We kind of just joined them for their breakfast and they just, they, tap a, a artery and they get some blood out of it and then they actually just patch it back up with some mud and they the cow's fine what yeah yeah, yeah that's wow. so that's they have a whole bunch of these cows in their little village they that and they they just tap it they like poke a little hole in it get a bunch of blood in their gourd then they patch it up and the cow's fine it's just like a human giving a little that's blood wild. draw and then they get the raw milk straight from the cow mix it up and they just drink it it all takes like a few minutes and that's just what they eat for the day. That's and fascinating. It was amazing. Super healthy, super tall, strong, like amazing. Like the Maasai are famous for being the, just some of the healthiest people we've ever heard of. They're kind of the last remaining, just like people eating like a traditional diet. And yeah, yeah they, they just, yeah, they just, they eat from nature. But the problem is they do start getting some of these sacks of corn and stuff because if you get closer to the villages, they need to, they kind of just need calories and it's just cheap. And so a lot of these villagers, not the hunter gatherers, but like the villagers without the, they're in between, right? They're, they're not getting the processed foods in the city, but they're just getting sacks of grain that mm -hmm. I don't think is properly treated. Actually, like in, in South America, they do, they put in the lime and it's called nixtamalization and it helps like get the B vitamins to, to be more available. They, I don't think they do that. And they're just relying on too many empty calories, basically. So they, they weren't doing that well in the, in the villages that didn't mm -hmm. have enough. I think they so didn't they were, have enough animal. I didn't think they had enough good nutrition. They were talking about their diet and we asked them, it was a bunch of old people and they were creaking around. So these people actually mm -hmm. did have the modern problem. They were bent over all kinds of problems. We had a whole group uh, we called the tribe of elders and we filmed with them and there's dozens, dozens of them. And they were, they were a very, very agricultural based, like 95% plant based, and they did not look good. That's really interesting to know. And why do you think there is such a stark difference, especially in countries like that, um, between the, the people that are living outside of the city and the city, is it a convenience thing? Is it like the, the more, the closer you are into the city, the more you need to have these fast, convenient foods. Cause life is just at a faster pace. I mean, what, oh I don't know. It's just like what happens in America. It's just like conditioning almost. It's like social yeah. conditioning mixed with cost, mixed with taste. It's so hard to not want to just eat processed foods. Yeah, unless you good. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, I changed my taste buds. So I don't think they taste good anymore. Well, yeah, same. I don't think they do either. So I should I mean, do like an a amendment. Good pizza but... tastes good, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. But I mean, you can make pizza with good ingredients, with good ingredients. Right? exactly. But like, I, I don't blame these people too. And it, the in Uganda is a bit different because even in the city, they could not afford processed foods. There was like one McDonald's and it was only for tourists. There was zero, you know, it was 10 times the cost of, of anything, right? Only for tourists, even the sodas and like snacks, those were kind of out of cost range. So mm -hmm. we went to these markets. It was all whole foods, right? They have huge markets of whole foods. Everyone looked pretty good. Everyone there was skinny, looked healthy. They they weren't even doing COVID. Like none of the none of these cities had this was a year and a half ago. No one was wearing masks. No one did it at all. They were all fine. We went to hospitals, empty hospitals, empty clinics. Wow. No one did COVID. They just like, they just said no. The government's just like, we're not doing this. And there wasn't problems because they're healthy. They're healthy. I mean, this is what I've been saying pretty much since day one of COVID that I was so frustrated by is that 
we were getting hit really hard because the majority of our population is unhealthy. I mean, what is the percent? I think it's like 8% of our population is metabolically healthy. Mm -hmm. And there was no messaging about this at all in any of our media outlets from our president, from our public health leaders, the people that are supposed to be helping us through this. I mean, this is, I found a new love for Bill Maher during all Mm -hmm. this because he was one of the only people on a, with a large platform saying, this is insane. Why are we not talking about getting sunshine every day, working out, prioritizing whole real foods, cutting out alcohol, cutting out sugar, like what that alone could have saved so many lives during the last two years. And it makes me really angry. It's crazy. And I posted all of these Bill Maher videos and it was amazing and they got hundreds of thousand views and it was just so cool that he was the one talking about it and huge he, yeah he was just saying this is a huge catastrophe missed opportunity this mm-hmm. is unforgivable like how did no one talk about this and it was just interesting to see other countries and how they didn't or their lack of addressing it because they were doing fine they So to finish the Uganda story, most people were doing fine because all they had access is to real foods. Maybe they didn't have enough animal foods. I think they, they just have to rely on like, just like 20 bananas a day or something like they're getting enough calories, but they had these cooking oils and it's just so cheap. I was going to say in this city, it's just cheaper to get cheap oils. You know, Mm -hmm. sometimes it's easier. Like it's expensive. It's animals are expensive that you know what I mean? To, to butcher animal is kind of a big deal. And then you save all the fat. I've been all over the world and these, you know, I've been to blue zones, Costa Rica. They're supposed to be plant-based. No, they had animals everywhere and these traditional families and they would butcher the pig and keep every ounce of fat and cook in the fat. And they'd make yogurt every day with the raw milk. And you know what I mean? It's all about yeah. that. So some people can't even afford to have a pig and save all that fat. So yes, if you need cooking oil and it's, you know, five cents. They didn't even have bottles. They had like Gatorade bottles. They would dump cooking oil into a Gatorade bottle. They like, you know what I mean? They'd find a Gatorade bottle in the street, dump oil in it. And then they started just frying all their food in it. And oh. I noticed that people after a certain age, like I was saying, it catches up to you. Mm-hmm. The people in Uganda, certain age, big, big, giant people. Everyone was seemed in shape and fine. M- women of a certain age, the menopausal age, gigantic gigantic. Wow. And I suspect it's the cooking oils because they had nothing else it could have been. They could not yeah. afford processed foods. They didn't, they couldn't afford sodas. They couldn't afford chips, couldn't afford McDonald's. All they had was whole foods and cooking oils. Do you know what these cooking oils were? Like Probably what they were made soybean out of? oil. Yeah. It's like corn oil, soybean oil. It's, yeah. Yeah. This is the cheapest oil they can get. They just, yeah. And then you look at the back of 90% of our packaged processed foods and it's in all of it. Soybean oil, corn oil. Yeah. And they guess canola. Canola. The craziest thing is you with food, you just don't realize it right away. If you eat, you know, some other things, you see the result immediately. I think that's the biggest problem. I'm thinking about how to ch- make changes. No one wants to change. No one wants to give up their processed foods, all that stuff. They don't see the ill effects until years down the line. It's so hard to connect it to that too. It's like, I'm trying to make these unscientific guesses at what's going on in Uganda. You know, it's like, I don't know. It's so hard to study. Like, how do I, how do I study? I mean, maybe we could do a biopsy on these big ladies, fat tissues and see the like, ratios of oh linoleic acid and all these polyunsaturated fats they've been eating. And, you know, we could do some comparisons maybe, but man, it's just, bad food just sometimes takes a long time to catch up to you and no one realizes it. Well, and I think you just hit the nail on the head is that even performing studies on this type of stuff is hard. It's really hard to take out all these different factors, lifestyle factors. And, um, you know, even just like when you think about in America, all the chemicals that were being exposed, like there's just so many different factors that it is really hard to pinpoint one thing. It's why, for me, I always just come back. I try to simplify it as much as possible for people. And I just say, look, like just try to focus on real foods because nature didn't get it wrong. If you're Mm -hmm. eating something that was once alive and came from nature, it's not bad for you. It's this, it's when we start getting into all the processed stuff that's been meddled with, that has really Mm -hmm. become an issue, but you're right. It's, it's hard to, to make those connections. 
And also a lot of people are just not taught to make the connection to their food either. People don't think about that. Like it, mm. we have been told that just as you age, you, this is just what happens. Mm -hmm. You know, your body breaks down, um, <clears throat> your metabolism gets slower. This is not true. You get on medication. Yeah. It's normal. It's like, yeah. oh, of course. Yeah. You're on three <clears throat> medications by 34 by 40. It's like, it just goes upwards. Yeah. It's normalized. Yeah. <clears throat> it's normalized. And so we're not even taught to even think that way and make those connections. And it's so hard to, to make those connections. Cause like you said, it's just a slow burn. So for, for people listening that are, are new to this journey, what is some advice that you would give them? Because the, I know that this is really confusing and hard to navigate. What would you, what would you say? Mm. It is confusing because everyone has their own diet idea. And there's, there's people message me. They're like, why is it so conflicting? You said this, someone else says that. I saw this video that said the third thing. You got to go back to what I was saying. The unifying theory is the whole food versus processed food. And you you can't really go wrong. And I, I mean, you got to just cut out like those three ingredients. If you if you walk around and and say, put in your mind that you have, say, a, a seed oil allergy. Seed oil, if you say that you're allergic to all vegetable oils, that'll probably cover 90% of bad foods. Just, just pretend, I don't know, put in your head, you're like I'm intolerant to seed oils and go about your life. You will end up having to eat whole foods and you're going to see a dramatic change. You don't need to worry about your macros. Probably you don't need to count calories. Probably you can just cut out. Well, hopefully all three of the highly refined ingredients and things will change. And sometimes I tell people just to, to get them going is take the diet. People have all these preferences, right? There's so many people are like religious about food almost, right? It's like my culture. It's my thing. It's what I do. Okay. Take the diet you're already eating, right? Whatever it is, it could be whatever foods you eat, like to eat in each group. Get, let's just get rid. Let's replace the most refined. There's gotta be some like the highest, highest refined ones. Like if you like to eat I don't know, bread or something worse. For me, it, would, it was just really the bread and the tortillas. Cut those out. Got rid of, get rid of those. Add more protein. Mm, get more. Yeah. I, I just say like eat a steak. Just replace the, the processed foods with more meat because I think no one eats enough meat unless you're Sean Baker or my carnivore buddies. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like these, there, there's certain people getting enough meat. If you're looking at the world, not enough meat. And I especially like red meat because- I think it's raised better. It has a better nutritional makeup. There's, I think there's a lot of things that are completely backwards with us demonizing red meat. So I say, get more protein in your life. You're going to be more full. You're going to be able to fuel your muscles and body to, you know, to, to support itself. And you're going to replace that. You're going to get rid of just say the bread, whatever, or it's the treats, whatever little, like I'm sure everyone has a certain amount of their diets this process. Get rid of that part slowly and replace it with more quality protein, especially just so you're full. I think that's a huge one because some people could get into like the whole food world, but then you could end up in this sort of like vegan whole food world and you're just eating vegetables and fruits all day and you're just not getting enough protein. So, yeah. And then you're starving. And I would even add on to that and say, eat more high quality fats too. Grass fed butter. Yeah. yeah. Usually avocado. comes with protein. You're yeah. right. But you're right. Fat, protein, some sort of combination of those. Because once you start eating more of those foods, you naturally crowd everything else out because you're fuller, you're more satisfied. I mean, this was my experience. I, <clears throat> I just started eating more high quality fats and eating more meat again. Cause I, I like I'd mentioned earlier, I was plant-based for five years and that was really what completely turned my health around was just incorporating more protein, more meat and more high quality fats. And, you know, and I would say too, for people that are just beginning on this journey, something that also really helped me instead of feeling like, okay, I have these foods, like, you know, the bread and the tortillas that I just have to completely cut out and like avoid just find high quality, real food replacements for that. So like, for example, I really like organic fermented sourdough, gluten-free bread. And I find that I have this mm -hmm. amazing bakery near me here in LA that makes it with whole real food ingredients. There's no mm -hmm. like seed oils in it. It's fermented, it's organic and it's gluten-free. And so if you can find those healthy replacements or like the cassava flour tortillas that I get mm -hmm. at the grocery store, things like that are a great option so that you don't feel like you're just totally depriving yourself. 
that's a good one. And I, yeah, I'm here in Austin. I was in LA. <clears throat> um, I got a chef over here working with me and we do a cassava flour tortilla with just lard. We use just Yum. like good lard from the ranch down the street and a little bit of salt and some cassava flour. Absolutely. Find those replacements. And maybe even it's good for a transition. I think there's just, it's not all or nothing. And you can go kind of on a journey and you, you could start with some replacements, find a healthy replacements, get yourself off those. Then maybe even try without them for a while see how you do, right? You like, who knows? You could be like, oh my God, my arthritis just totally went away. Even though it wasn't yeah. the gluten, you know, because it's still something in the bread, even though it's, you know, like a really good bread. So I always tell people, tr get rid of the, some of these things for, you know, months and months at a time. And then you can come back to them. And then, and then maybe you can heal your gut a little bit more and then you can come back to them and you can tolerate them better. But yeah, yeah. good point. Yeah, that's great advice. I love that. So before we go, is there anything that we haven't covered that you just feel like it's really important for people to know? Oh, well, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm into the satiety. You talked about feeling full and feeling satisf satisfied. I mean, that's satiety. And I think that's really important to me. It's, it's part of some of my unifying theory stuff because I kind of, do you know, Dr. Ted Naiman, have you heard of this guy? Okay. No. He he's into the same stuff. Down. He's, he's really great. He's on Twitter a lot and he's really fit and he's just really into kind of these simple high level nutrition stuff. And we're, we're kind of on the same page on this stuff. We kind of developed some theories together where it's like, why are whole, like whole foods are good. Processed foods are bad. Kind of like why? And a lot of it's to do with the, the processing. And it's kind of a lot to do with the satiety that if you are taking if you're processing down foods and then you look at them at the same amount of calories so say like if you ate an egg say if you ate like five eggs and that's whatever calories and then you ate the same amount of calories worth of bread right that's going to leave you completely different in the status like how long you're satiated right and i think that actually matters a lot because losing weight or losing fat specifically is basically a battle of hunger right? Everyone, everyone knows this. It's like, oh, yeah. how, cause everyone's just 100%. trying to eat less, right? The, the strategy isn't to eat less. Like I said, that can be done in the short term. You can eat less and lose weight. That's not helping you. That's not good nutrition wise, unless you're eating the correct foods and it's, you could be losing muscle, right? All that stuff. So if you're trying to win this battle of how do I lose fat and not be hungry, the answer is to be satiated for longer. So you can eat less without trying. And the answer is everything we just said, protein, fat, high quality, natural proteins and fats, and whole foods. It, does that make sense? So like, yeah. it, basically, if you process down foods, one of the reasons why they're bad is they're not, they interact with your body differently, right? They affect mm -hmm. your blood sugar different, your hormones, you can get in all these details. I do podcasts, it's like GLP and GIP1, there's like neuropepto. So all these like hormones and incretins and stuff that goes on in your gut when it's highly processed. And it hits your blood sugar faster and makes you hungry faster. And you can, your blood sugar can go up and it can come down. You can go hypoglycemic, you know, and then you, you, your blood sugar is low when you're starving again. So, so much has to do with satiety. And so much of that is eating fats and proteins and whole foods. And then everything else kind of comes naturally. So yeah, to me, it's just like, it's kind of this magical thing that brings it all together is why whole foods are good and why you know, people who do whole foods diets, they're not sitting there tracking calories and macros. It's because they're naturally satiated. Again, nature doesn't make mistakes. When you eat a bag of chips, once you pop, you can't stop. They're designed yeah. to make you keep eating. And I actually, one more quick thing. I, I of course agree with the hyper palatability argument. And there's food scientists that are developing food to make you keep eating all that hundred percent agree. But it proves a point of satiety. If they were actually satiating, then you could eat a whole bag of chips and then be full for the, the rest of the day. They're yeah. not satiating. They're empty foods. They're bogus, fake foods. So you are hungry again a few hours later, even though you just ate the big chips. So it's not necessarily the fact that they're hyperbalable in a sense, right? It's the fact, because if steak was hyper, steak is so good to me, I could eat a gigantic steak 
but then I'm just full forever and I'm not going to eat again. And it all, it's all fine. So really it comes down to the satiety, which really comes down to nutrients, protein, fat, minerals, vitamins, giving your body what it needs. Absolutely. I mean, it's that very popular saying that I've heard a lot in this community in the last couple of years is that people are overfed, but undernourished because we are not eating these nourishing foods. And it's why, like you just said, someone can eat an entire bag of chips and then be hungry an hour later. But if you eat a massive steak, you're probably not going to want to eat the, most of the rest of the day because you're going to be full. And it's because your cells are being nourished with pr- true nutrients that your body is actually asking for versus these, um, food like products that are devoid of any sort of nutrients that your body and your cells actually need. That's it. That's the theory of everything right there. It's like, why, why are whole foods good? Why is meat good? Well, animal foods have bioavailable nutrients and vitamins and minerals and protein and simple as that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So I want to end this with a question that I ask all of my guests what are your personal health non-negotiables? These can be things that you either do on a daily basis or a weekly basis, mm. no matter how busy you are mm. just to take care of your health. You know what? It's actually, so I think there's four pillars to health and that you can't cheat nature in these four pillars. And it's your food, it's exercise, it's sleep and it's sun. It's like, get it. Yes. Yeah, so, so sort of sun outdoors. And I actually am most strict. My non-negotiables are the other three other than food. People think that's crazy. I'll have a pizza once in a while. You know what I mean? It's like, oh man, this wasn't like the perfect gluten-free sourdough pizza. If I'm, you know, wherever I am, I'll eat the pizza. But my, so my non-negotiables are the other things. Sleep. I will get eight hours of sleep no matter what. If I get less than hours of sleep, I'm going to find a time to take a nap. Like, yeah. I'm obsessed with that. Like my, my mom had Alzheimer's. <laughs> I'm not trying to, you know, deprive my body of sleep. I think I'm most consistent with sleep most consistent with getting outside, getting sun, I get my vitamin D and most consistent with movement. Like I have a simple workout, 25 minutes, twice a week. I mean, I do play beach volleyball. I do some sprinting as well, but I'm talking about in the gym. I'm only in the gym 25 minutes, twice a week. That's non-negotiable. I don't skip it because it's all, I can always do that. No matter how busy you are, I'm up to 11 PM actually these days, every night working 9 AM, 11 PM. It's crazy trying to do too many projects, trying to finish the film. I'll still work out. You know what I mean? I need to move my body and I need to sleep and I will get outside. So, so absolutely those three. I love that. Yeah. I'm you are, you and I are on very similar pages with that as well. Mm -hmm. So for everyone listening, where can they find you and give us any details about the docuseries, like when it's coming out, where to find it? Yeah. Yeah. Just search for food lies. So on YouTube, search for Food Lies. You'll find the intro. Got to watch that three and a half minute intro. Subscribe. Instagram, do a lot of stuff there. Just search for Food Lies. Twitter, Facebook, I'm there. The internet, I'm there. So definitely do that. The film is quite the beast. It's been such a journey. We're refilming. We're doing second interviews with people just to make sure we get every ounce of gold out of them, get an even higher quality footage. We're going all out custom composer doing an entire score from scratch. We have a graphic artist that's going over every single study and every single piece of information we do to make it into a, you know, infographic and having hundreds and hundreds of studies. It is insanely hard. It's going to be a six part series. It's we're trying to finish it by the end of the year and we're trying to get on Netflix and I think we have a really good shot at that. We have some good distribution companies wanting to work with us and help us take it worldwide, like be even beyond Netflix. And, you know, they have these big strategies to go everywhere. So that's awesome. Stay tuned. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. I watched the preview for it and I was blown away. I was just like, yes, someone <laughs> needed to make this. So thank you for making that. It'll be, oh it'll, yeah. So the, the work is well worth it. It'll pay off. It will so. be. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Brian. This has been such an amazing conversation. I really loved it. All right. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks.